Hi, everybody. It's John Welch. Um, and on behalf of Bistro of Lasakova and the rest of um, the team, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of our COVID-19 preparation, particularly um, around personal protective equipment and some very basic airway management uh, scenarios. The objectives of this session are pretty simple. We want to talk you through um, what we're going to do in simulation. So we want to share with you some of the background around putting on the PPE and taking it off. And this is going to be much more in depth than the information that was put on the hospital website. We think it's important to go through this in some detail for those of you who might potentially be managing an airway of a COVID-19 patient. Um, we will go through the basic airway management considerations, and we understand that there will be a, a number of extenuating circumstances and a number of uh, challenging cases. We want to give you the basic fundamentals based on all of the literature and a number of uh, experiences so that you can apply those when uh, cases or situations become more difficult. And finally, uh, doffing or removal of the PPE. Some very general COVID-19 considerations, and this is not uh, the, the platform for us to talk about uh, case management or anything specific. This is just around uh, your safety. But COVID-19 is requiring droplet precautions. There is a lot of evidence that fomite spread uh, or transmission is possible. Fomite uh, is anything that's on the surface of any of our equipment our clothes, et cetera. So uh, that's why the PPE considerations are very important. You should assume that surfaces are dirty. Um, anything in a room with a patient who has COVID-19, just assume things are dirty. Thus, when in doubt, you should wash your hands and you're gonna hear me say this a million times, don't touch your face. Starting right now, don't touch your face. Some very basics of infection prevention and control. You'll hear this referred to as IPC. Um, the key is protecting yourself from contamination. Um, the patient is theoretically already infected. And so really here, the goal is protecting yourself. Once again, your hands are dirty. It is not a question, your hands are dirty. So just assume always that your hands are dirty. So do not touch your face. Stop touching your face. Someone listening to this right now is touching their face. Don't touch your face. Really, really limited, limit the touching of surfaces in the treatment areas. So, you know, we're used to leaning on things. We're used to rearranging our workspace, et cetera. You really, once the patient's in the room and you start treating that patient, you really want to limit how many surfaces you're touching. Perform hand hygiene as often as necessary. So when in doubt, wash your hands. And of course, in the operating room, that will be using Purell. If your gloves are soiled, or if it would make you feel more comfortable, you can change your gloves. Just keep in mind, the more times you're taking your gloves off, the more risk there is of contaminating your hands. So unless they're visibly soiled, um, try and avoid too many glove changes. Um, but hand hygiene is extremely important. And finally, the science will set you free. So there are many people listening to this who have taken care of lots of different very infectious patients, and we're very aware of that and, and um, appreciative of your experiences. I think all of us have these basic IPC concepts in our mind. So keep those things at the forefront of your mind and let the science set you free from your fears uh, and your anxieties around this. So we're going to talk through the donning of the PPE for COVID-19. These are um, slightly different recommendations than what you may have read or seen on any website. We want you to follow, please, these guidelines when you're working in the operating room. The first thing I'll say about donning uh, the PPE um, is run the donning checklist to yourself before you enter the treatment area. Each space where you'll be putting on the PPE will have a checklist available to you. And then you must be cross-checked by a colleague to make sure your PPE is correct before you enter the treatment area. This is very important. You don't want to realize that you've forgotten an important part of your PPE after you get into the treatment area or the patient's room. 
The PPE is to keep you safe, so be tempered and be very cautious in your approach. So to put it on, the first thing you do is to perform hand hygiene. Why? Because your hands are dirty and starting with clean hands seems like a good idea to me. The next thing is to put on your gown. Ensure whichever way you put on the yellow gown that it's not slipping off your shoulder. Now, there is a chance that we'll switch to, um, to paper gowns or, or uh, disposable gowns, and if that's the case, they, they'll tie in the back. So make sure that you're nice and fastened um, behind your neck and at the waist. The gown should fully cover your torso from the neck to, uh, to your knees and uh, from your arms to the end of your wrists and should wrap around your back. Make sure whichever way you choose that the, that the gown is not slipping off your shoulder. The next thing is to don the N95 respirator mask. So hold the mask in the appropriate position, placing the bottom strap at the middle of your neck and the top strap at the middle of your head. Fit the flexible band to the bridge of your nose and then do a fit test of the N95 um, by placing your hands over the mask and assessing for any leaks around the edges. You wanna make sure that the mask is fitting snugly to your face and just below the chin. Finally, you wanna to avoid touching your face during this step. So just touch the outside of the mask. Why? Because your hands are dirty. Next, you wanna apply your face shield. This is a full face shield and not goggles or just eye protection. You want a full face shield. Um, you want to ensure that shield is snug around your forehead and that when you get into the room, it won't for, for some reason um, drop down into your field of vision. We're not recommending goggles because the face shield provides a much better all over um, face coverage uh, for splashes or any sort of exposure during airway management. Next, you want to apply your gloves. And this step also varies from what the hospital recommendation is as well as the recommendations that you might read about on the CDC or the WHO websites. We're recommending using surgical gloves that have long cuffs, and that is because while you're managing a patient's airway, there is an increased risk for exposure, and you don't want your glove to slip below the cuff of your gown and expose the skin there. Now, you can't contract COVID-19 through your skin, but if you get it on your skin and then you don't wash it off, there is a risk of later exposure. So we want you to use surgical gloves that, um, and pull the cuff of that surgical glove up and over the cuff of your gown. Then, particularly if you are going to be the person managing the airway, you need to place another set of gloves, nitrile exam gloves, the same as we use every day, place those over top the sterile surgical gloves. And when we talk about the airway management, we'll, we'll mention why. Before you go into the room, ask a colleague, and someone should be there helping you out, ask a colleague to read through the checklist with you and make sure you've done all the steps on the checklist before you go into the room. If for some reason you get into the room and you realize that you have missed a step, you need to immediately go to the doffing area and step-by-step step work, th work through the doffing procedures, okay? You can't rush out of the room. You can't uh, skip any steps. You need to do the doffing procedures step-by-step. Step. So we'll discuss very basic airway management in COVID, and these are recommendations that have been compiled from many, many uh, different resources. You will likely, over the next few weeks to months, be reading different recommendations from all different places, and as we get more and more experience, both in the country and here in Boston, for managing these patients' airways, we will continually update this information. So we want you to know that these things could change. But for now, these are our general recommendations and the principles you should be following. So before you begin, remember that your safety and your health is the priority in this situation. So... You want to make sure that you're putting on that proper PPE and that you're following um, these instructions. You want to limit the number of people in the room. So we're talking about um, a nurse anesthetist and an anesthesiologist plus an anesthesia tech and one operating room nurse. 
the rest of the people should wait outside until the airway is secured. Also, you should communicate with the various um, leadership, so the board runner and maybe whoever might be a free set of hands, to know that you're doing uh, an induction on a, a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patient. And perhaps one more airway person could be fully donned um, but waiting outside the room so that if you need another set of hands, they're available, but they should not be in the room with you. And then you just want to formulate an early plan. You want to talk about what your plan is for, um, induction, including what meds you want to use, what things you might do if you get into trouble, um, and how you're going to manage that communication. And you also want a clear understanding of the workflow, which we're going to talk through here, but you want to make sure you review those things with everybody. We will have these various visual aids and reminders in the room that you can go over step by step. You want to make sure you've assigned roles very clearly and an experienced airway provider should be the person managing the airway. It doesn't necessarily mean an attending, but someone who is experienced in airway management and intubation. And then clearly define the roles. So who will have the first attempt at the airway? Who will have the second attempt at the airway? And what your plan is if you find yourselves in a situation of a failed airway. Now, once again, this is not a difficult airway scenario. And we anticipate if we're in this situation, it will be relatively controlled. One of the roles you need to define then is the tech. And they should stay as clean as possible and stay at the Bluebell um, in order to, uh, to hand supplies and different equipment to you all. Um, there will be a dedicated Bluebell for the um, COVID-19 cases, and um, that Bluebell will be clearly identified and then will be uh, very thoroughly cleaned between cases. One other thing we should point out that it's important for everyone in the room to keep an eye on each other. So if there is a situation where it looks like there was a breach in the PPE or that someone may have contaminated themselves, that that is very calmly communicated and you can very quickly and easily go um, to the, the doffing station, doff your PPE and take care of the issue with your PPE. Make sure you're well prepared the same way you always would. So you have working suction that the anesthesia machine is working and the oxygen is available and all your medications are set up. You wanna make sure that the filters are on the circuit and most of our circuits have filters already in line and those are adequate for this scenario. If you plan to use a Mapleson or a, you know an anesthesia bag, you want to make sure that the filter is at the elbow of that, that Mapleson uh, because that is considered an open system and you want the filter as close to the patient as possible. And then finally, uh, we are not just recommending, but essentially mandating that you use a video laryngoscope to manage these patients' airways. Uh, the reason for that is that it gives you much more distance away from the, uh, the patient should for some reason they cough. Um, you, you can stand much further away. Um, and the second is that if you get into a situation where the airway uh, becomes a challenge, you already uh, have the most reasonable and, and useful equipment in hand, ready to go um, from that moment. You wanna avoid mask induction. So all of these patients will need a pre-op IV. You wanna avoid high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. You wanna avoid awake fiber optic and you want to avoid any sort of open suctioning. The reason for that is that these are highly aerosolizing uh, procedures, and that increases the risk of exposure and increases the risk of contamination from the patient. Again, these are droplet precautions. So anything that you're doing that's spraying droplets or producing more aerosolization or um, causing the patient to cough can increase risk. You want to use the lowest possible gas flow to maintain oxygenation. So while you're pre-oxygenating, use two hands on the mask and you want to use as low oxygen flow as safely possible. So for intubation, again, pre-oxygenate at the lowest, safest uh, flow rate. Rapid sequence is the safest. You want to use 
rapid sequence into in induction without manual ventilation. We're strongly recommending to avoid manual ventilation. If for some reason you must ventilate, you should do it with the smallest tidal volumes at the lowest pressure using two hands. Intubate using a video laryngoscope and make sure that that equipment is working, obviously. As soon as you are finished intubating, immediately inflate the cuff and place the circuit on the end of the endotracheal tube. Once again, making sure that there is a, a filter on that circuit. Use your outer glove that you uh, place. So you placed double gloves. Use the outer glove to cover the laryngoscope blade and then drop that blade into a sealable bag. So at this stage, you need your anesthesia tech to be standing at the bedside with that large uh, plastic sealable bag and allow you to drop that covered laryngoscope blade into the bag as soon as you're done. Um, and then the other thing is if you have to disconnect the ventilator for any reason, you wanna stand by the ventilator, turn down your fresh gas flows and consider, particularly if the patient's coughing or spontaneously ventilating, whether or not you clamp the endotracheal tube. To confirm endotracheal tube placement, use end tidal CO2, chest rise, and point of care ultrasound. The reason for this is again, um, there could be contamination on the patient itself. You contaminate the stethoscope and you're much closer to that patient. If you must auscultate, be very, very careful. You want to um, drop that stethoscope then into a receptacle for things that need to be cleaned, all right? Only if absolutely necessary. After induction and intubation, you should wrap that blade in your outer glove. The airway equipment should be sealed in that plastic bag um, and taken out of the room as soon as possible according to the procedures that the anesthesia techs have in place. When the case is finished, the room and the equipment requires thorough terminal cleaning and housekeeping and our, our staff know what they need to be using. Um, you'll notice now that those uh, the wipes, the cleaning wipes, have switched to having purple caps to now having white caps. Those The white caps on the cleaning um, wipes will kill COVID. Um, so those are the ones that we're using. And then the infection prevention and control folks will determine how long that room needs to be closed in order for enough air exchanges that they think that it's no longer um, contaminated. Extubation. So I know what you're probably thinking. Will we actually be extubating COVID-19 patients. The scenario that we're thinking through here is actually one of having a mildly symptomatic child. Fortunately, uh, there are extremely rare circumstances where we will see a, a very, very sick child with COVID-19. All right. So what we're thinking about here is a patient who might be confirmed positive for COVID-19, but develop some sort of surgical emergency. So perhaps some trauma or even more likely uh, requiring an appendectomy or some other emergency surgery, okay? So it is very likely that you would consider extubating the patient as long as physiologically everything looks okay after the surgery is over, okay? So in that case, we want to, again, make sure you're in proper PPE and you will be because you're in the room, you haven't left. Um, most importantly, double check that all your airway equipment is available, okay? Don't forget that after you intubated this patient, you, you covered that laryngoscope blade and then you put it in a plastic bag. I would suggest that you get a new blade uh, in case the need for reintubation so you don't contaminate yourself by reopening what you already sealed. Deep extubation is preferred, and that is, again, to prevent any coughing that you might notice, either during emergence or after extubation. You want to be very sure that the patient is breathing spontaneously, and if you're concerned about the patient's ability to maintain their airway, then your clinical discretion should definitely be used uh, to decide whether or not the uh, deep extubation of this patient will cause more problems later on. But if all other things are equal and you think it's safe, deep extubation will probably be right. And then using antiemetics, 
to just be sure that retching, gagging, and, and vomiting aren't increasing uh, the spread of the virus. So the doffing procedures for COVID um, are a little bit different here than what you saw in the hospital video, and there is a number. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, I think most importantly, if we just go through the, the the doffing procedure, you'll understand why some of these are, are different. Um, doffing is m definitely more dangerous than than donning, and even sometimes being in the room because now you're trying to take things off, and you could potentially be contaminated. So, the most important thing is to take your time and to have someone coaching you through it. You don't have to memorize these steps. You don't even have to refer to a checklist on the wall. You want somebody standing nearby giving you verbal cues and talking you through this so that you can focus on doing one thing at a time. And anytime you're in doubt in this process, just perform hand hygiene. You wanna be sure that the trash can and the linen hamper are open um, before you start because you don't want to have to try and open those things as you're taking your PPE off. And finally, when you're using the alcohol-based hand gel, you wanna to continue to rub your hands together until that gel is dry, okay? So not sometimes the sort of cursive, quick um, hand gel that we do uh, coming in and out of a room. You want to wait until that gel is dry. So yes, this process will take some time. First thing you do is uh, take off your gloves. The outside of your gloves are contaminated. Your hands are dirty. If you feel like at any point your hands become contaminated, stop and just perform hand hygiene. So first thing, using your gloved hand, grasp the palm of the other gloved hand and peel off your first glove. You want to be very careful as you're peeling it off that you're not snapping it, right? So take it nice and easy, one finger at a time, take your time, pull the glove off and discard that first glove. Now, use the fingers of your ungloved hand to slide under the cuff of your gloved hand and peel that glove back. And again, avoid snapping, touching only the inside of that glove and throw the glove away. Discard the glove and perform hand hygiene. Your hands are always dirty. Then the next thing you wanna do is remove the face shield. To remove the face shield, lean forward, grasp the back strap at the back of your head and remove the shield in a motion away from you. Immediately discard the face shield and then perform hand hygiene. The next thing you wanna do, and this is really the hardest part, is to remove the gown. So there are lots of ways to do this, but follow these basic principles. Avoid touching the outside of the gown. Avoid reaching across your body. Avoid reaching in front of your face and avoid shaking the gown aggressively. If the gown has ties, reach behind you without reaching in front of your face or reaching across the body. So what I'm saying is, if you're using your right hand to untie the gown, only reach to the right side of your body. You do not wanna reach across your body or in front of your face. If the gown is a wraparound, like the yellow gowns that we use, you wanna slip your hand to the inside portion of the gown and take that first part of the gown off. Usually at this stage, you'll have to try and shimmy your shoulders out of the gown. And there's no perfect way to do this, but if you follow those principles above, you'll be able to get your shoulders free from the gown. Once your shoulders are loosened from the gown uh, and remembering that your glove cuffs were covering the cuff of your, your gown sleeve, you wanna slip your fingers underneath that cuff of your, of your sleeve and pull your arm slowly out and just let that gown drop. The next thing you wanna do is do that with the other side. Put your fingers under the cuff, pull your arm out of the sleeve. Okay, and then you, without shaking the, the gown too much, only touching the inside, you wanna fold it slightly and put it immediately into the dirty linen hamper. Then, you guessed it, perform hand hygiene. Now, at this stage, you want to leave the treatment area. 
The reason why is that you're no longer in PPE. And if you take your mask off, your N95 mask in the room, there's a risk of potential exposure. So leave the treatment area or the operating room and then let the doors to the room close. From there, you want to, and there will be a station set up for this, you, without touching the mask, you want to reach behind your head, again, without reaching in front of your face, and grasp the bottom strap first and lift it over your head. Then you want to repeat the same with the upper strap, taking care not to stop, snap the strap or fling the mask, and lift the mask off of your face and immediately discard it in the trash. And then you guessed it, perform hand hygiene. This next step isn't listed anywhere for the CDC, the WHO, and that's because their guidelines and recommendations aren't considering the operating room environment. So in the operating room environment, you want to remove your surgical cap. And yes, I realize that you're still within the, the confines of the operating room where we generally wouldn't take our hat off. This will be for a brief moment, okay? And this is uh, just for COVID patients, which will hopefully be rare for us. So take your surgical cap off, perform hand hygiene. Once your hands are dry, put on a new surgical cap. Then from there, you wanna go to the scrub sink and wash your hands with soap and water, wash them thoroughly. I like to sing the entire rap from TLC Waterfalls. I realize about 95% of the people listening to this won't know what I'm referring to. Choose a song, sing the first verse and the first chorus to that song, and you'll probably have clean hands afterwards. I just want to say to you that this, these are uh, anxiety in, uh, invoking times. People are worried and scared, and all of those worries and fears are founded. But we've got to come together on this. We have to work together. We've got to trust the science. Uh, and we have to take care of each other. I'll just say that it does take courage to work um, with patients who could potentially make you sick, but I'll say that courage is not the absence of fear, it's the triumph over it. So with that, I will end this slideshow by thanking a number of people, Bistra Vlasikova, who's uh, our SIM representative and has been instrumental in putting all of this together. Caitlin Lysens, um, who's been our administrative support for this, and Jamie DeCaro, who's the chief anesthesia tech and has been extremely responsive in making sure we get this right. Uh, Craig McLean and Beth Eastburn, along with Janet Balasenti, Lindsay Waller and Allie Crest, all of whom will be your trainers for donning and doffing your PPE. Jamie Payton and the rest of the airway team, including Pete Kavatsis and Ray Park, who have uh, looked over all of our airway stuff, as well as are working very hard on developing other airway uh, protocols for us. Prabhaka Devavaram, who is thinking through how we might um, take care of a patient down in the CT scanner or an MRI. Peter Weinstock and the entire team at Simpedes who've been great in helping us develop this uh, simulation. Tracy, Tracy Wolbrink at Open Pediatrics who has very, very rapidly put this uh, teaching uh, video together, as well as Monica Kleiman who's been great in sharing with us the preparations of what's going on in the ICU. And finally, the entire anesthesia staff, all of you who are participating in this, thank you for your patience. Um, we wanted to put this together to help allay some of your fears and also as a way to uh, stimulate conversation and begin uh, what will be an evolving situation for us to be able to answer your questions.